Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. What a great day to worship the Lord. It's so good to see you. And we have light shining in. Uh, this day just screams the glory of God and his love for us. I am so glad that you're here to worship the Lord. So uh, let's do this. Let's pray together that God would speak as we open his word now. Lord, thank you for uh, speaking into our hearts and our lives. We thank you for these uh, worship leaders who've guided us to you. Thank you for Stephen and our team. We thank you for how you have blessed our church with so many who are leading across our campus today. And Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior, whose light continues to shine upon us. Lord, draw us to you. And may we never be the same encountering you today. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, some of you know that um, I have been a part of this church, um, my favorite church on the planet, for many years, really for three decades. I came out of seminary and was here as a youth pastor, young adult pastor, among other things. I went out into the wilderness. I was in McKinney for about 11 years. And, um, and the Lord brought me back. He called me back here, never dreamed um, that that would take place. But we, uh, we're here. Some of you uh, I've known for 30 some odd years. Um, did a wedding last night, just so many people in the church that, that have, you know, I've known for 30 plus years. Now, you, some of you know a lot about me. I talked about Stacy last week, but um, you may not know that I have, I have a cat eye. Do you know this? Anybody know this? I have a cat eye. Um, I, have, I have what's called a coloboma. It's an elongated pupil. And uh, so when I was a kid growing up, I had to get tested off and go to the, you know, optometrist because they said that the only thing maybe is that I get more light coming in to my eye than normal people as the pupil may not close like others. And so I had this theory as a kid growing up that I could actually see better than most people in the dark. And um, like Spider-Man and so, or like a cat. And then I, I realized Spider-Man's not real and, and the cats actually have more receptors in their eyes. They have more rods in their eyes. It's not the pupil at all, but I still want to go with that theory. My, my theory was at least right that any problem you have seeing really is a refraction of light and ability of light to come in. You can't see without light. That's the point, right? The same is true spiritually. As we often see in the physical world that guides us to understand the spiritual world, the same laws that govern the physical universe, there are spiritual laws that govern our relationship with God. And today we're going to find ourselves in John 8. As Rodney and others have noted, today we're going to talk about Jesus' statement, I am the light of the world. Turn to John 8. Everybody open in the word of God. Don't you love diving into the word? I just, I mean, this is my favorite time every day, diving in the Word. I hope that you're reading, following along with us, uh, our dwell reading plan. And can I say it as your pastor? I expect every member to be doing this together. It's why in our connect groups, we're asking each other, hey, turn to your neighbor. What are you learning? We're going to hold each other accountable. It's what we do. We want to be in the Word, and we are doing that in our church. This is for all of us in guests. You can join us if you're online. Many of you are watching, but I'm, I'm a pastor of a local church. This is how God is leading us, and anyone can join in. But every member should be walking together. We have a, the reading plan. If you don't have your, sure enough, your bookmark, you can grab one today. But Jesus makes this audacious claim. In uh, John 8, when he says, I am the light of the world. We're going to ask three questions here. Um, what is light? What is he talking about here? What is darkness? And then how, how do I find the light? So look at verse 12. We'll start there. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's quite a statement, the entire statement. Now, we noted last week, um, when he says, I am, in these I am statements, he doesn't always say this, it's tied to a verb, I am doing this, or I am going to do this. But here, he says, ego, I me. There's two ways to say I am in the Greek. Ego is one, I me is another. It's a strange construction, he puts them together. I am, I am the light 
of the world. We know that the other place we see this, along with the I am statements, is in uh, Exodus 3, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where Moses asks God, you, perhaps you know this, well, what is your name? Who do I tell them has sent me? And God says, I am. Same construction. In fact, Yahweh, you probably know, literally means I am who I am. God is saying, I, I'm, I'm, I'm self-existent. You're not going to put a name on me. I will name myself. I am who has always been and always will be. And in this one verse, look at it again. I am the, the light of the world. Whoever, look at this. This is a Christian life. Believe that I am the light of the world. Follow me and you'll not be in the darkness any longer. And in the, in the light, you will have life. The light of life. We've said Zoe life, one of John's favorite words. So what is the light? Take notes on the sermons. Let's, let's jump in. Now you would expect or guess, even intuitively, if you've never read this before, if you've never opened the Bible, you could guess light is enlightenment. It's overcoming darkness, a symbol for a lot of religions. Um, in fact, uh, you see at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, the earth, all things, it was dark. And we know in scripture, Darkness is chaos, and it's scary, and there's nothing there, and, and it's emptiness. And then the very first thing God says as he speaks creation into existence is what? Let there be light. Light begins everything. Because there is no life without light. And we see this throughout, again, all religions. I mean, our Jewish friends just finished the Festival of Lights, which they call Hanukkah. They, they light eight different candles over a period of time. I was in Delhi some years ago during Diwali. Maybe you've seen their Festival of Lights. Mohammed is said among the Muslims to bring the light of truth. Buddha was the enlightened one. And interestingly, as he was dying, gathered his uh, core leaders around him because they were fearful you're going to die. What do we do? And he said to them, the light is within you. No one gave me my light. You have your light. Discover your light. Follow your light. That sounds a lot like the secularist view in the modern West today, doesn't it? You find your own light. There is no outside authority of light. You find your own light. Discover your light. And you do you. You just follow whatever light you have within you. Jesus steps into that space, all of this, and he says, I am the light of the world. Not a light. The light of the world. So all of this makes sense, even if you've never read this passage or, or heard him say this. But watch this. As often the case, when you look at the context, when and where he said this, it is spectacular. You see how audacious and how clear this statement is. It's explicit. We're here in the middle of John. As we were walking through our reading plan, we're a little earlier on. But we're in the middle of John now. And about half the book of John, you may not know this, enters us into Passion Week. I mean, we're going to be halfway through in a bit. And we're going to find ourselves. He is creating quite a stir. Because here's where this takes place. He is on the Temple Mount in the court of women. We know all this because of John 7, 8. He's about to, watch this, he's about to heal the man born blind. The light of the world is about to show what he does, patterns throughout the book of John. He makes a bold, audacious statement about who he is, his identity, then he proves it. Or he proves it and then he says, that's why I did this, because of who I am. And so what happens here, he's standing in the, the court of women, it's called. It's, uh, John notes this because it's a very busy place between the court of Gentiles and the, the inner, inner court where the priests could go. A lot of action here because this is during the Feast of Booths. And it's the final day or maybe the next day, but at the end of eight days is the Feast of, of Tabernacles. Celebrating, if you know your Old Testament history at all, celebrating the pillar of fire, the light that came to the people when they were in the wilderness for 40 years. So they're commemorating, it's like Thanksgiving, it came at harvest time, and they're celebrating God's provision and how good he's been, his presence guided them as people. So what would happen is they had these giant 
uh, candelabras, they're really vases, they, the 45 gallon vases up on these sticks that had lights in them, candles, and they would light up the whole place. Imagine no electricity, I can imagine this. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you would see this for miles. It was called the illumination of the temple. And, and, and this is because they're trying to emulate, reproduce this, this pillar of fire and then just celebrate God's provision, how he, how he guided and directed his people as the light in the wilderness. Jesus, again, steps into that moment. And, and, and again, if it's the next day or the day, the final day, it was called the great day, the big day of celebration. But it's kind of, I'm thinking post-Christmas. Like, we love Christmas Day, and now we all have to take our lights down. And we're about done with this celebration. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world that never goes out. You follow me, and you'll never be in the dark. It's not unlike, I thought about this, it's like flying west. Let's say this afternoon, this would be fun. Let's all go on a trip. We're gonna jump on planes. I don't know if it's fun to jump on planes these days, but let's go on a trip. Let's go west. Let's all go to California. I'm making this up right now. Let's just go there to the beach and we're gonna have a great time. But we're gonna fly and when we fly, if we go fast enough, think about it. You go west and as the sun sets, if you fly fast enough, you're in light. Just continue to follow the light. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Follow me and you'll never be in darkness. Again, though there's a lot of darkness around us. So Jesus, the light of the world. Well, what is, what is he talking about here? What, what is this light? We saw it in our reading this week. John 1, 4 and 5. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Now watch this, play of, of life, light. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, earlier Jesus says, I'm the light of life, of Zoe life. So now we move from our optometrist to our horticulturalist. Because you see, without light, there's no life. Plants can't live without light. Plants do an amazing thing. How incredible is God? Plants can trans transfer or transform light, change light into energy. Photosynthesis is what that is. Oxygen, water, light turned into carbohydrates for plants that can grow. Just incredible. And again, we see this in our spiritual life. Jesus is saying light brings life as well. If you live in the light, if you receive the light, you receive Zoe life. This is light. Now, what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. You look up light in the dictionary, it's, it's defined in the negative, right? Because if there's light, there's no darkness. Darkness cannot overcome light. Only light can overcome darkness. If there's a source of light, darkness does not stand a chance. But if we're in the darkness, we're plunged deeper into darkness. So watch this. Now we see a dialogue between, don't miss this, a rabbi, Jesus, and the Jewish establishment, the leader, the Pharisees. So the Pharisees said to him, you are being witness, you're, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Now they're saying two things. One, that's just circular reasoning. You're claiming to be whatever you mean by light. You're saying the light of the world. But they're also saying uh, our law demands that you have two witnesses and you're just one and this is ridiculous. They want to write him off. I've heard people say this about the Bible. That, you know, the Bible claims to be the word of God. Uh, and it's just circular reasoning. Okay, well, unless the Bible can prove that it is the word of God, which it does. This is what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is proving, and he will prove again in John 9, healing the blind man. He is the light of the world. The Bible says, taste and see. Come on. This is what Jesus is doing. Taste and see. This is important to understand. Rabbi challenging the existing beliefs among the people. He is the illumination of God. He embodies the law. They're going to their law immediately. Hey, our law says this. 
You've got to be wrong because we already know what the law of God says. And Jesus is stepping into this space saying, I embody the law. I fulfill the law. He is perfect law right in front of them. Jesus, how about this, is perfect theology. And this will come into play. He is what God's word looks like, appropriated and obeyed perfectly. So here I am, and if you see me, you've seen the Father. You should make the connection here, and they're not. Look at this. What we're going to see now in this dialogue, in these verses, they reveal four things that we're going to look at real quick and kind of hold a mirror to ourselves here, not just throwing rocks at the Pharisees because we can often become the same. We see four things in this dialogue. One we've seen in verse 13, when you're in the dark, you're argumentative. When you're in the dark, you're directionless. When you're in the dark, you're judgmental. And when you're in the dark, you you keep others in the dark. So first, they did not believe him because they already had a light. This is important to note. Their light, their law, their yoke, they called it, their light, the way they saw the world was through the law. We all have a light. Every person, you say, I don't don't know that I believe Jesus is light, but you, you have a light. You have something that you're holding on to that you believe is your guide. And for most of us, it's flipped right around and uh, it is me. It's me, I guide myself, I am my own God, is where most people in our day seem to live. Everyone has a light. Jesus steps in and he confronts us and he says, no, I'm the light. Because when we don't have the light, we're living in darkness. We find loopholes like they did. We're always looking for excuses. We're always challenging what we already believe about God or about life. I've talked to so many people who say, Jeff, I struggle to believe. This is that word that's repeated over and over again. This is John's favorite word, believe throughout the entire uh, gospel. And I talked to so many people. I did so this week. Um, I would call him a spiritual seeker, but skeptics, cynics, Um, I've talked to people who, oh, the faith thing, the believe. When Jesus says, believe, you know, we just want to roll our eyes or believe. Oh, it's so hard for us to believe. And some some people I I talk to will will say, well, uh, you know, I know people who believe. They just kind of have this simple faith, my wife or a friend of mine or whatever. I just don't have, I can't do that. Like I've got, I mean, I have intellectual barriers that I have to faith. And I am, and see what we do, this pride sneaks in as if others don't. Like I'm thinking really deeply about this and I struggle with my faith. You know why smart, educated people don't believe? They don't want to. That's why. The same as uneducated people. They don't want to. Jesus even said this. And he said it to the Pharisees. And my, my point is this, that often we think, well, faith is simple for some people, but not for me. Listen, faith is a challenge for all of us. It's why here we talk often about having an intelligent, thoughtful, intellectual faith. Faith doesn't go against reason. Faith precedes reason. We ask this question all the time. What's truer? I understand, therefore I believe. Which was uh, Thomas Aquinas, the great um, Catholic father, scholar. Or I believe, therefore I understand. That was Anselm of Canterbury, a long time apologist from way back. When I look at scripture and I think of the words of Jesus, even here, belief belief precedes understanding. There are some things you need to know, yes. But when you believe, you step into the light and the light comes on and you start to see things that you never thought you could see. But until then, if we're in the darkness, We continue to ask questions. We keep pushing back. We're argumentative. It was Diedrich Bonhoeffer who said, keep on asking questions and you eliminate the need for decision. That's where many of us are. And friends, listen, there is a terminal darkness. My point is this. If you wrestle with belief, join the club, okay? But you can believe. You can believe. You just need to press on into it. You can believe. Jesus said, just a mustard seed of faith will lead you into greater faith, which is why the great prayer we find in Scripture is, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. 
And Jesus says, I am the light, follow me. Belief requires humility that some of us do not have. That is where we're tripped up. But they're, they're, that can lead you to a terminal darkness. Now, this is crazy. The Pharisees talk about God all the time. And Jesus will say, you don't even know God. How about that? They studied the law. They knew all about it. It's a shocking message. But friends, listen, careful obedience to God's law may actually serve as a strategy for rebelling against God. Like, I've got this. I'm doing all the things. It's like the older brother in the prodigal son story. He was keeping all the rules and he could not join the party because he was too just. He was too religious. Could it be? That's exactly what's happening with Pharisees. Look at verse 14. Jesus, in, in other words, they know the law. They don't know him. They know what it is, we could say, to be a Christian, to go to church, to do the things. And you don't abide in Jesus. You don't know him. Look at verse 15, or 14. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I come from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. Jesus knows exactly who he is. He knows where he's from, knows where he's going. The Pharisees are directionless. When you're in the dark, you have no idea which way is north, south, east, or west. You certainly don't have a true north. And Jesus is saying this, light is perfectly capable of bearing witness about itself, right? If you can see, there is light. Light has full authority about its existence. Jesus steps in and says, I am the light that was, is, and, and, and will be forever. I came from my Father. You don't know where I'm going. I'm eternal. See, a lot of people approach the Bible. Even here today, we wrestle with Jesus. The Bible's outdated. It's an ancient text. Um, it's like we've moved past 40-watt light bulbs. I mean, candles, light bulbs. We have LED lights. I mean, we're now enlightened. I mean, come on. This is like 2023. And Jesus says... I am the eternal light that never changes. I love C.S. Lewis is the one who said, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. In a moment. The latest, greatest thing. When you're in the dark, you're argumentative. You're directionless. And look at this, you're judgmental. Look at verse 15. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. He's saying, I, I judge no one like you do. I mean, here's the judge standing before them. But they judged according to the flesh. Look at verse 16. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Now he's saying, you want two witnesses? I got you two, me and my Father. And we're one. But okay, if you want two, here we are. I don't judge according to the flesh. We often do that. We judge people by the way they look. I mean, if we're really thoughtful, we immediately judge people by the way they look by maybe it's the color of their skin or what they're wearing or their position or we find out oh they're that person and we judge jesus says i don't judge anyone that way i judge according if he's going to judge at all according to the, to to the to the heart and he is always right now you're you're argumentative here you're directionless you're, you're judgmental and verse 17 look at this You'll keep others in the dark. Your law, in your law it says, or it's written, that the testimony of two people is true. Now when he says your law, he's not throwing shots at the law. He's throwing shots at their interpretation of the law. Because a lot of people say, I believe in the word of God. Well, you, know, you believe in your, in your interpretation of the word of God. Which is why I always say, we look at the word of God and we look at the way of Jesus, the person of Jesus. Because oftentimes our theology and the way of Jesus don't match up. And Jesus is going to trump that because he, again, is perfect theology in the flesh. We can become like the Pharisees, become functional hypocrites, looking good on the outside, keeping the law dead on the inside. Are you alive in him today? Look at verse 18. I am the one who bears witness about myself and the father who sent me bears witness about 
Jesus had called them the blind leading the blind. They had no light within them. What Jesus is saying here, I find this interesting. It hit me this week. He, you know, when he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's saying, if you knew God, he's telling them, if you really knew who he was, you would see me, the way I'm acting, what I'm saying, and you would say, that's him. Matches up. So he's saying, you don't know God because you're rejecting me. If you knew him, you would be receiving me, right? When we reject Jesus, friends, here's here's the challenge for us today. You live in darkness and others are brought into the darkness as well. So what do you do with this darkness? How do I come into the light? That's the question. How do I come into the light? Because watch this, certain things grow in the dark. Right? We, we've talked about this before. I mean, fungus grows in the dark. Uh, moss grows in the dark. Mushrooms, algae grows in the dark. You go down to the depths of the sea, you'll find the, uh, the abyssal devilfish, the ugliest thing on the planet. Because ugly things grow in the dark. He has a little light on him, by the way. And he, his teeth are so big, he can't close his mouth. The ugliest creature you'll find. Ugly things grow in the dark. You go to the surface, go to about three feet, down to about 30 feet, where coral grows, you see the most spectacular fish on the planet. That's where the clownfish swim, that's where Nemo's swimming around. I mean, beautiful things grow in the light. Amazing things grow in the light. But friend, even in your own life, And I've experienced this recently. As a pastor, I've experienced it through the years. When someone is caught in sin, whether it's infidelity in a marriage, caught in a lie, abuse, when sin comes out, here's here's what happens. Bring it into the light. Bring it out into the light. Because not until we're brought into the light do we deal with our garbage, our sin. It's why we're to confess our sin one to another. And that, can we just, honestly, that's a hard thing to do, to come into the light. It's like coming into the bright light. But friends, listen, I'm telling you, some, some of us, all of us here, in varying degrees, we have something, we're living in the dark, and we're hiding out, and it needs to be brought in the light because sin can't grow in the light. It can't grow in the presence of God. You're only going to get darker and darker until you self-implode. It's why Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King said, darkness can't overcome darkness. Only light can do that. That's a biblical, that's scriptural. He said, he said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So when we come into the light, we're met with the light and love of Jesus, the truth that convicts us, and it brings life. How do I find the light? Look at this, verse 19. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you you know neither me nor my father. If you knew him, there it is. If you knew me, you would know my father also, because we're one. I am, right here in the flesh. Look at verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury. Now John's given us context to say, this is a crowded spot, but no one could arrest him because his hour had not yet come, busy place. Now here it is as we land. When Jesus speaks this explicitly, there's always a threefold response and it's happening today, right now as you hear my voice, as the spirit speaks to you. There are those who, who, who uh, reject him. They, they, they hear verse 13 and, and throughout. There are those who are inquisitive and want more information. That's verse 25, if you kept going. And then there are those, this whole passage ends with verse 30. There are those who received him and believed. Where are you in that right now? Because Jesus goes on and says, I'm going away and you're going to seek me. And you'll die in your sin. What is it? What is it? You're, they're going to seek him? Watch this. If you don't receive Jesus, and I'm talking to someone right now, right now, you will spend the rest of your life seeking for only what he can give you. You will continue searching and searching. And then he says this, you're gonna gonna live this life, always asking questions, never having answers. Always seeking the light, always living in the darkness. Always knocking, never opened. 
until you say yes to me. And in verse 23, he says this, but he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. And he is added by the translators, I am. You will indeed die in your sins. Don't miss this, friends. You and I, there's, there's coming a day, it says in Hebrews, when we will, it's destined for, for each person to die once and to face judgment. Every single one of us. And the judgment will not be based on how good you were or not. There's no scales. The judgment, because we're already condemned in our sin. The judgment is based on what you have done with Jesus, the light. You will either step before God Almighty Die in your sins before him. Or you will have your sins taken away before you die. And only Jesus can take away your sins. He goes on to say, the son, when the, when, when the, son, is, the son of man is lifted up, in verse 28, reference to the cross. And then in verse 29, he says, I always do what is pleasing to my father. Only Jesus can say that. Jesus lives the perfect life as our substitute, lays down his life on the cross for us so that you and I would believe and not die in our sin. Friends, I'm pleading with you today. Jesus says in John 8, 32, he closes it out with this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Again, Lewis is the one who said, said, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun, that the sun is risen. Not simply because I see it, but because by it, I can see everything else. Come to Christ, the light of the world, and you will see the world as it is, and you will abide in him. You will be in his word, and you will never leave the light as you follow it for the rest of your life until you see him face to face. Praise be to God. He is the light of the world and in him, the light of life has come. Let's pray together. Lord, right now in this place, we are encountering your spirit upon us. I pray for every person here who's never received your grace. Friend, let me ask you now with your head bowed, eyes closed. Do you believe? You can believe. Step in by faith. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Let your light shine upon my heart. I'm sorry for my sin. I give you my life. Thank you for taking away my sin upon the cross so that I don't have to die in my sin. And I can live with you forever and live in the light here and now. Lord, we love you. The only right response is to say, yes, I believe. Help me with my unbelief as I pursue you in your word and follow you every day as a disciple. Lord, continue to bless our church. Continue to add to our number daily those who are being saved. And we pray, God that we would never be the same. As we go into the world now, you send us out as light in the darkness. In your name we pray, amen.